قل هذه سبيلي أدعو إلى الله على بصيرة أنا ومن اتبعني وسبحان الله وما أنا من المشركين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأصلي وأسلم على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد Dear brothers and sisters in Islam Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh And welcome to this new episode of Ask Zad Our first caller for today is Maham from Pakistan Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh uh, so uh, there's a famous person uh, who gives tafsir, um, and he seems really knowledgeable in uh, tafsir, and he gives references of different uh, tafsir works, like um, the tafsir of Imam Razi, um, al zamakhshari al Anusi, uh, which I am not sure if they are authentic, and he also gives his own interpretations of uh, Quran, um, and uh, he seems really knowledgeable in Arabic, but uh, the problem is that uh, he doesn't seem to have uh, a good knowledge of Hik, and he does some haram things, and uh, so um, I, I read that for a person to interpret the Quran, he should be knowledgeable in Hik, um, and since I've started to read uh, the Seer of Quran, and um, I read the Seer of Ibn uh, Kathir and the Seer of Saudi, uh, and uh, but because he, uh, the person gives really good and detailed explanation of Quran, um, uh, I uh, like listen to him. So is it permissible uh, to listen to his steps here? And like, if I teach it to others, right? okay. First of all, <clears throat> Ibn Sirin, may Allah have mercy on his soul, one of the great Tabi'in, said that this knowledge is religion. Whether it's knowledge of fiqh, whether it's knowledge of tafsir, whether it's knowledge of aqidah, he says, and this was also attributed to Imam Malik and so many other great scholars of Islam, this knowledge is religion. So check out who you receive your religion from. Nowadays, unfortunately, with the influx of social media and the access of information at your fingertips, whether it's on Instagram or YouTube or Facebook or even TikTok, <clears throat> people have found a platform for them to become famous. And people of ignorance, laymen, Normal people are amazed and fascinated by how articulate these people may seem because they don't have the tools to scrutinize what they say. And hence, they are fooled by them and by the number of followers. So they start to listen to them. And especially if they are from the same ethnicity, if they're from the same culture or country, then this adds more wood to the fire and they become blind followers, defenders of such people. This is Islam. This is a religion. And we're ordered to only take our religion because it's something we believe in from the Quran and the authentic Sunnah with the understanding of the favorite three generations, the, tab the Sahaba, the companions, and the Tabi'een, and the Tabi'i Tabi'een. Az-Zamakhshari, the compiler of Al-Kashaf, the book of Tafsir, was one of the deviant scholars and imams of Al-Mu'tazila, which is a deviant sect, one of the 72 sects in Islam that the Prophet warned us from, alayhi salatu wasalam. 
Therefore, a person who benefits from it and endorses such a tafsir, this raises a lot of red flags. In addition to that individual's lack of knowledge of fiqh or his lack of knowledge in aqidah, and definitely by endorsing al-kashaf and al zamakhshari and the likes, his aqidah is corrupt. So who's in, who in his right mind would go and learn from such an individual? Yes, he's famous. He has a lot of followers. But at the end of the day, this is his problem and his followers' problems. Your problem is how to save my neck when I'm in the grave and when I face Allah on the day of judgment. Therefore, do not at all listen to such people. Learn from the trusted people. Tafsir ibn Kathir, Tafsir al-Si'di, Tafsir al-Shaykh Abu Bakr al-Jazairi, which was, is one of the great tafsirs that is not as known and famous to people, unfortunately. I don't, I don't think it's translated even. These are the great tafsirs you should learn from. Lots of those other people who may sound articulate and knowledgeable in Arabic, they all take from other sources that cannot be trusted. And when cross-examined, you'd find a lot of flaws. May Allah protect us all. Farheen from India. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum, salam wa rahmatullah. Wait for seven months, I come to the time, I'm first time expecting mother. And I'm much unaware about my health and the changes that happened. But a few days ago, I had a severe chest pain after I did so many vomits. And it was so severe that I have, I was crying so much. And I called one of my cousin sisters, who is in paramedics, about what to do. She got panicked of me crying and called my parents and asked them to visit me. And when they came and they took me to the hospital, seeing my condition, since my husband wasn't available. My mother-in-law was also aware about my condition, but instead of taking me to the hospital, she was giving me all the home remedies. But my parents took, and from the hospital, uh, my parents took to their home with my husband's permission. One day later, my mother-in-law started yelling on my husband and telling him that I called my parents without asking her, and she also tortured. I can't hear you, Farheen. Can I repeat again, Sheikh? No, I heard you until your mother-in-law shouted at her son. Yes, uh, just one day later, I was very sick. He sh she shouted on my husband and telling him that I called my parents without asking her. Even though she knew that I didn't do that, my parents came to know uh, uh, from my cousin that I wasn't well. And I was crying. So then my parents came and then they took me to the hospital. I understood. I heard, I heard all of this. What is your question? I, I just wanted to ask that since then, my husband isn't uh, uh, talking to me properly. And I tried resolving this issue with him. And he showed me later that he's all fine. But I feel, I feel he isn't still that connected to me like he was before. I feel so hurted and I don't know what to do. I, I need your advice on this, Shay. The advice, the advice is... Treating people with kindness and tolerance is the best remedy. Now, your husband is caught between a rock and a hard place. He loves you. He cares for you. But at the same time, his evil mother is filling up his head with gossip and false information. And she's the only mother he has on this earth. Regardless of how evil she is and due to that he does not have the ability to stand up and confront her because he doesn't want to be disobedient or disrespectful and at the same time the pressure she is exerting upon him is overwhelming so instead of you adding more insult to injury rather you should back off a little bit and let it slide. Don't nag him. Don't ask him what's wrong. Why are you sad? Why aren't you talking to me? Why did you change? Who did this to you? What have I done wrong? And you keep on repeat, repeat, repeat. No, this would only 
make things worse. Rather, be tolerant. Give him some time. Give him some space. And he'll come back to you. He knows that his mother is evil. Unfortunately, like some mother-in-laws who think that their daughter-in-law is, is their slave and they have the right to control them, even if they would harm them physically or kill them because of their ignorance of treating such an illness. Nevertheless, brush it off. She's his only mom on earth. So give it, give it some time. Don't nag him. Give him some space. He'll come back to you, inshallah. Taiba from the U.S. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah for taking my call. Wa alaikum salam wa barakatuh. One, uh, one question that recently my son passed away, and some people think that uh, jinn poses with him, that's the reason he made a suicide. So my question to you is that, is this possibility that jadu or kill jinn poses the suicide by themselves? First of all, what the people say is totally out of order. Such people are not known to be knowledgeable. They're not known to be scholars of Islam. They're not known to be physicians or doctors or scientists. Most likely, they don't even know how to do things on their own. So all what they're doing is filling your heart with despair, making you more depressed and sad, as if it's not enough that your own beloved son committed suicide. This by itself is a crisis, is a calamity, is something that breaks anyone's heart, let, a, let alone a mother. Secondly, what is done is done. And what's in the past remains in the past. Nothing on earth we could do that it would reverse it. The only thing that we have control of is to depend, rely, and have total confidence in Allah's mercy and forgiveness. This is the only thing that you can hang on and cling to. So keep on asking Allah for forgiveness. Keep on asking Allah Azza wa Jal to have mercy on your son. And trust that Allah Azza wa is the most forgiving, most merciful. Whatever caused your son to commit suicide, whether it was jinn possession, black magic, mental illness, or mere weakness, it is to Allah the most merciful to deal with it. So leave it with someone you trust that is more merciful to your son than you to your own blood, flesh and blood. And may Allah grant him rahma and forgiveness. Talha from the UK. Talha. Medina from Germany. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Okay, um, so my question is, um, there's like this verse, it's I think in uh, Zura like 51 and uh, verse 47. And there's like the word Sama, and people say that uh, this verse is like, um, it, uh, like uh, a wonder in Islam, because it's like talking about the expansion of the universe. But like some people say that this Sama can be like translated in a different way, and it's just like the way that people like try to interpret the word so yeah i just want to ask about like sama and like the context and why it can be universe or something else the word as sama may have a number of meanings and this is the beauty of arabic language the verse you're referring to was sama abanaynaha bi aidin wa inna lamusi'un and the heavens, the skies, the seven layers of it, we have, that is Allah, we have built it with strength. 
بِأَيْدٍ This is referring to strength. وَإِنَّا لَمُوسِعُونَ And we will expand it, which means that it's ever being expanded and growing. And this is the universe. These are the galaxies, the heavens, and whatever you want to call them. So here, وَالسَّمَاءَ بَنَيْنَاهَا It refers to the heavens, the skies. Now, in other verses, for example, وَفِي السَّمَاءِ رِزْقُكُمْ In the same verse, in the same surah, previous ayahs, in the beginning, Allah said, وَفِي السَّمَاءِ رِزْقُكُمْ وَمَا تُعَدُونَ Here, السَّمَاء refers to الْعُلُو As in the verse, أَأَمِنْتُمْ مَنْ فِي السَّمَاءِ أَنْ يَخْسِفَ بِكُمُ الْأَرْضِ are you in safety that the one over the heavens, fissama, not inside of it, because nothing can incubate Allah Azza wa Jal, the Almighty. Rather, as-sama here means in the height. So, are you in safety that the one over and upon the heights would not concave the ground and destroy it so that you would fall into an earth pit? So this or these are two meanings of a sama. Either heavens and earth, sama or al-ard, this is what everybody knows, or a sama which means the height, al-ulu, which refers to Allah Azza wa Jal being on top of everything and nothing is over Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah does not need anything to be on top of but he is the all exalted and the all high and I hope this answers your question. Jamila from US. Assalamu alaikum, sir. Assalamu alaikum, barakatuh. Hi, so I work as an overnight nurse and I wanted to know um, is it a 12 hour shift? And I wanted to know if I do the three pools, would that um, protect me from, um, protect me during my shift? Jazakallah First of all, to seek Allah's protection, Allah has given us what is known as the adhkar phrases from the Quran, from the hadith that we repeat during the day and the night, so that we would remember Allah Azza wa Jal. These act like antiviruses on our computers. They protect us. They form a high wall and a fence where shaitan cannot over uh, 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 climb or penetrate. And we say these in the morning, in the evening, after fard prayers five times a day and before going to bed and also before leaving the house. The three qul, which is chapter 112, 13 and 114, they are recited in the morning and the evening three times each. So after fajr prayer and uh, after Asr or Maghrib prayer, depending, we recite them three times each. We also recite them before we go to bed by cupping our, our hands, blowing in them, then reciting the set. Ikhlas, falaq, nas, then wiping over our whole bodies, cupping it again, blowing again, and reciting the set once again, and do it three times. We also recite it after each fard prayer, in addition to Ayat al-Kursi. These are the three times we recite the three quls. And with the grace of Allah, in addition to other adhkar, which are found on the fortress of the Muslim, the booklet, Hasn al-Muslim, the fortress of the Muslim, which you will find an, an explanation of on my playlist, inshallah, on YouTube and also on my website, where Allah graced me to 
explain the whole book and when to say these adhkar and the benefits of them, inshallah, you will be protected with the grace of Allah. Um Amina from the Emirates. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalamu Can I wipe on a sock that has a hole of like a penny size? And how high does it have to be above the pointed ankle pad? Jazakum bai khair. Wa jazakum. In order to wipe over the socks when making ablution or wudu, the conditions are, number one, that you put these socks on while you are in the state of minor ritual impurity, which means that you've made wudu and you still did not break your wudu. Regardless whether you put them on immediately or after five hours, as long as you are in the state of wudu that allows you to pray, you can put them on. Condition number two, that you keep on wiping on them for 24 hours for a resident or 72 hours for a traveler. Condition number three, that the socks cover the area that is usually washed. So it must cover your whole foot, including the ankles. So if a little part of the ankle is showing, the, the wiping is not valid. Now, if I have a small hole in my sock, would that jeopardize the validity of my wiping? It's an issue of dispute. The most authentic opinion is that it would not jeopardize your wiping because what's you, what you're wearing on your foot is still considered to be a sock. And the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, did not have the luxury of having intact socks or hoof all the time because they used to travel on foot for miles and hundreds of miles, which means that definitely they, it had some worn out socks that had a hole here or there. And this is the opinion of Sheikh Islam bin Taymiyyah and other great scholars that a, such a hole does not invalidate your wiping and Allah knows best. Sumaya from the UK. Assalamu alaikum. Walaikum salam to Allah. Um, my question is, um, so 24 hours before I met um, Ghusl, which was mandatory, I oiled my hair and uh, usually I did a lot of hair, a lot of oil in my hair because my hair is dry usually and I braided them. So 24 hours after that, I had to make Ghusl. Um, I didn't unbraid my hair um, and I didn't do any shampoo. I just did the Ghusl and I came out. And then hours after that, when my hair dried and I was touching my braids, um, I found oil in my fingers. So does that invalidate my ghusl? First of all, the most authentic opinion is that we do not have to unbraid our hair when we perform ghusl. Whether it is a mandatory ghusl for a woman after being pure from menses or postnatal bleeding, or it's a ghusl for uplifting a major ritual pure impurity resulting from nocturnal emission or sexual intercourse. This is the most authentic opinion. And as long as you have soaked your scalp and hair with water, as per the sunnah, and ensured that the water had reached your scalp and you washed thoroughly your braids, then your ghusl is valid, even if, if you find traces of oil, because oil is not a layer that prevents water from reaching the desired area. And usually it's absorbed by the hair, by the skin and the likes, and only this feeling remains but it does not prevent water, and Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. We have a short break. Stay tuned, and we'll be right back, inshallah.
Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today I'm going to talk about the book Interactions of the Greatest Leader. Ibn Mas'ud, may Allah be pleased with him, said, The noble man of Quraysh passed by Allah's Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and with him were Shu'ayb, Bilal, Ammar, and Khabbab, and other weak Muslims. They said to him, O Muhammad, are you pleased with these people as being your people? Are those the ones that out of all of us Allah has blessed? Are we going to follow those people? Send them away from you. Perhaps if you do, so we will follow you. So Allah sent his verse, which means, And do not send away those who call upon their Lord morning and afternoon, seeking his countenance. Tafsir al-Tabari Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and welcome back. Uh, Brother Fahim from Bangladesh. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. A Muslim man passed away leaving behind his wife and a two month old daughter. His unmarried younger brother married the widow to take care for the child. However, a year later, the brother engaged in an extramarital affair. So he sent back his to her parents and they didn't show much interest to solve this. But the wife never wanted divorce. But he ended up divorcing his wife without paying Meher till now. He said that if she needs the Meher, then she has to apply through the court. A week after the divorce, he married the woman with whom he had the affair. So the question is checked. Since except his elder sister, all of his siblings accepted that. As a form of protest, his elder sister refused to acknowledge the marriage and cut off kinship with her new sister-in-law forever. Are the elder sister's actions justified and whether the marriage is valid? Jazakallah. Jazakum. This is none of anyone's business. This is none of anyone's business. The man divorced his wife, who happened to be his uh, widow, the widow of his brother. And then he divorced her. What reasons? It's not to us to judge. We don't know what happens behind closed doors. He divorced her. He didn't pay her, her the, the mahar. He is sinful, committing a major sin, and Allah Azza wa Jal would punish him in his grave and on the day of judgment. All what he has to do is wait, and then he will find what he had committed in his grave. And of course, he will find that much earlier when Allah takes away the blessing from his business maybe grant him some illnesses that are incurable because of his zulm. Do you think that Allah created you on earth to transgress and wrong people without being held accountable? Freebies? No. Wait, it will come. Now, as him marrying this woman, the second woman, no one has the right to accuse them of having a relationship unless they bring four male Muslim witnesses testifying by Allah that they had seen the male organ in the female organ. A'udhu Billah. How would anybody do this, Sheikh? Well, this is what's mentioned in the Quran and in the authentic Sunnah. Failing to provide such four male witnesses means that you're slandering this Muslim, which is punishable in Islam by flogging 80 lashes for whoever dare and say such a statement. Reputation of a Muslim is protected. You can't go around and say, oh, he committed zina. He had a relationship. He had an affair. Because this is slandering. Now, what the sister does with her brother, whether or not acknowledging his wife or not, this is up to her. This has no ruling in Islam in saying that, oh, you did this or you did that. This is normal behavior that people are held accountable for. You don't want to see your friends anymore, up to you. You don't want to communicate with your Sister-in-law, up to you. There's nothing wrong in that. 
as a Muslim, if you see them face to face, you have to exchange salam. This is the minimal requirement. Assalamu alaikum wa alaikum salam. That's it. If you don't see them for 10 years, you don't have to pick up the phone and give them a call. They're not your kinship. Total strangers. So I hope this answers your question. Wasim from India. Assalamu alaikum. My great grandfather found some gold while digging a house as a laborer and took it without the permission of the property owner. My grandfather used to do business with goats and amassed a huge property. My father also acquired a lot of property. Now, I'm wondering if I can inherit this wealth as it might have originated from that stolen gold. My grandfather most likely used that gold, but we don't know much about this story. Is this a recording? Can I inherit, and if not, then can I... It is. Okay, so uh, Wasim says that his father found gold in the property of his own father, which I'm presuming that he inherited the property and whatever was in it. And he doubts whether it is stolen or not because his grandfather was a notorious uh, blackbeard um, pirate, maybe, I don't know. So what's the ruling? As long as we don't have any evidence to back this theory or doubt up and we don't have any proof, in this case, the default is the gold and the property is halal for you and your grandfather to use and Allah knows best. Adrian from Serbia. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So we'll nail a cracking and no speaking break the fast and is it haram? Jazakallah khair. If you don't consume any of your nails or uh, uh, whatever you pick from your nose, if you don't eat it, it, does, it has nothing to do with your fasting. And instead of giving you a fish every day, rather... It's best for you to learn how to fish. The things that nullify your fasting are a handful. The things that nullify your wudu are a handful. If you know them, anything else does not fall into breaking your fast or your wudu or your Islam or your ibadah. So, in order to learn, you have to go back to the basics and go to the chapter that deals with fasting. I have so many clips on the things that nullify your fasting. Count them. There are seven or six in number. Once you master them, khalas, you don't need to come to me again. Aziz from India. Aziz. Aziz Bahai. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Come, Sahatullah. Sheikh, I missed up a question. You asked a question yesterday. And my father actually does it still. So, my question is Will my halal learning become haram as I am living in his house and eating from his food? Okay, I answered you. I said, as long as you're earning halal, regardless of what your father is earning or paying for the house and the food, this is his sin. For you, it's halal. There is no problem in that, inshallah. Abu Rayyan from Senegal. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Sheikh, my question is I read from Imam al Albani, may Allah have mercy on him, that. Amen. One of the places that is not permissible to pray is the elevated place on which the Imam stands, making him higher than the place of the followers in prayer. So I was wondering, like, how high are we talking? Is it like an extra mat on the regular carpet, okay. or what is it? Th this is an issue of dispute among scholars. And the most authentic opinion is if the Imam has a step that's 
elevating him from the rest and he preys on it, this is not permissible because it gives him a sort of a edge over the worshipers as if he's better than them. But if it is done due to a legitimate reason, for example, the Prophet once والسلام, prayed on the pulpit so that everyone would see how he prays. And whenever he wanted to make sujood, he would mount off that pulpit and walk down, make sujood on the ground, then climb up again. This was done once or twice as a form of educating the masses, not to an arrogant person who thinks that I am a ruler, I am a scholar, I can't pr pray with these uh, uh, peasants. I have to be uh, elevated. Now, the carpet itself is not an elevation. No one would see the imam standing on a carpet. Oh, mashallah, he's wearing high heels. It's little. Nevertheless, I personally don't use such carpets. When I go to masjids and I see, and they t ask me to lead, and I see that it has a carpet, if it's possible, I remove it so that I pray on the same carpet that everyone else is praying on. Why would I have an extra carpet that has lots of decoration that may distract me? This is, doesn't make any sense. We're all alike, so I remove it and we pray all together on the same carpet and Allah knows best. Imad, Imad from Sweden. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, Sheikh, I have a question, which is, uh, my father has sacrificed uh, everything for me, he, which he had in Sweden, in Syria, in order for me to get an education in Sweden. Um, he has been working 10 years in Sweden. I have been studying in, for 10 years. Next semester, inshallah, I will be studying <coughs> in a university that is very hard to get into. However, I will be forced to move away from my parents to go to another city to study. Um, this results in more rent and other expenses which I can't pay for. And alhamdulillah, my father has the means to, uh, to pay for all of this until I finish studying. Uh, however, he does not want to, ta to uh, spend on me from his savings. Rather, he wants to take a bank, uh, a loan. loan from the bank, which no. has usury. Okay. In it. Um, naturally, I don't want him to indulge in usury. So I just, I'd suggest two options. The first one is that he pays for my expenses by his savings. And the other one is that uh, I take a break from studying for a few years in order to uh, be able to pay for my expenses. And I would gladly do that. Um, however, my father really does not like both options and he gets irritated whenever I mention both of them. His argument is, um, is that I might not be able to get in the university if I take a break to, uh, to work. And that is, uh, and that there's a good chance of that. And um, he would be very displeased with me if I don't study next semester using his loan from the bank that he will eventually take. And that's my question. I want to say to him, Sheikh, I <laughs> you are totally right in your decision. Now, if you know that your father is going to borrow with haram money and you have a saying in it, then you have to stop it and block it. What do you mean, Sheikh? I mean, if your father is going to apply for student loans in your name, so you'll be the one who's paying the student loans and the loans are on you. In this case, it's a matter of life and death. Do not accept. Even if he's irritated, he's angry, whatever, it's totally haram. If he's the one who is applying for a personal loan on his name and his uh, responsibility, in this case, this is his own actions and doing. You have no power over that except to give him advice and tell him this is haram and try to convince him being polite, diplomatic, and dutiful at the same time. If he insists, then there's nothing wrong on your side. Let him take the loan. You do your studies, try to uh, um, excel in your university and be able to stand on your own two feet and pay back your father his hard work 
that he is invested in you. Now, there is no sin on you. Now, my recommendation would be is, Father, you have savings. My advice is, use your savings for the university. If I make it, alhamdulillah, I'll be able to pay you back as a loan. If I don't make it and your savings run out, you may then take a loan that is interest-based and pay it accordingly. You would have shortened the amount of time where the interest is compiled upon you, and this is lesser um, uh, interest you have to pay. And who knows, maybe I managed to strike the jackpot and succeed in my university based on your savings, and it's all halal in halal, and I'll pay you back for it. I hope this makes sense to him, and Allah knows best. Binta from Italy. Assalamu alaikum. Allah. Do you re uh, remember my last question? I don't remember what I had for lunch yesterday. So the um, uh, the Africa thing and the niqab. The what? The Africa thing and the niqab. The niqab. Nope. Okay, the... I I, I um, okay. So last time I asked you that uh, if what uh, um, a necessity. Um, to, to go to school if my parents are sending me to Africa otherwise. So you said no, so I um, refused to take off my niqab and go to school. So my mom uh, called um, a social worker um, because uh, when I first uh, left school, uh, the school um, called a social worker. And the, sh the social worker think um, think that uh, I'm brainwashed by you. So by me? If I was yes. So if I wasn't uh, going to restart to school, they would uh, uh, put me in um, uh, where they put uh, people with uh, mental problems. So I restarted school, and then my question is: um, Is it a necessity to? use a password, uh, a passport that uh, has a, a photo of me without uh, hijab to go to a country that uh, where I will be free to practice. Because uh, if I remain here um, and I don't uh, go to school, that will happen. And if I remain here, the rules in the country are uh, change, changing. And uh, I fear that they will um, make a rule uh, in blocking the uh, niqab. Okay, so first of all, listen to me, listen to me, Binta. We base our rulings in Islam upon pros and cons. Whenever the prones, pros outweigh the cons, Islam says take it. Whenever the cons outweigh the pros, Islam say refrain from it. Now, as a schoolgirl, you love niqab. If you find that niqab inevitably is going to cause you to be harmed physically and abused or be restrained in a mental institution, mental health institution, and classified as crazy or something, this is not logical. So turn the table on their heads. Don't wear the niqab. Wear the minimum requirements, which is the hijab. And whenever you're out of the school, wear the niqab. Whenever you go out, wear the niqab. So that they would not hamper your niqab and hijab and Islamic practice to the best of your ability. To have a passport without hijab, if this is the only possibility to have a passport, this is okay. To leave the country, your family, to another country just to wear the niqab, this is not permissible. Why, Sheikh? I would like to practice my deen. Practicing your deen is not limited to wearing the niqab. Your safety, your well-being, your financial independence, being taken care of, protected by your family, cannot be compromised just because you're not wearing the niqab and you want to go to a foreign country and sold as uh, a slave or being uh, uh, sexually harassed or um, abused and the likes. No, 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 no. This is totally out of the question. So don't let shaitan 
whispers, whisper in your ears saying that you have to do this, you have to run away, you have to migrate, and you will find your uh, knight in shining armor waiting for you to get married and have a good family, blah, blah, blah. This doesn't work like this. It's not a fairy tale. So do the level best of your ability without compromising your health and safety with your family. As Allah says in the Quran, فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ مَا استطعتم. Fear Allah to the best of your ability. But don't throw yourself in harm's way like that. And Allah knows best. Idris from Holland, the Netherlands. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Assalamu Sheikh, I have a question. Um, is a person uh, sinful if he cuts his beard up to a fist length like uh, Ibn Umar? May Allah be pleased with him. This is an issue of dispute. And I would not say that he would be sinful, but I would say he would not be following the sunnah because... Only Ibn Umar and maybe Abu Hurairah, may Allah be pleased with them, were reported to have this understanding that the beard can be shortened if you do this and you cut whatever exceeds a fist length. So, whoa, I have a lot. <laughs> I can, I can, uh, I have credit. I can do that. Why don't you do it, Sheikh? It looks nicer. Yeah, it can look nicer, but as there is an issue of dispute and there are two opinions and both have grounds for what they're saying. So Sheikh bin Baz, Ibn Uthaymeen and my whole uh, uh, posse of, of scholars that I follow say it's not permissible. Why? Because the Prophet had never done it, alayhi salam. All the instructions were to keep it and honor it and let it be. And the companions in majority never did it. Okay, I respect this, I follow this. The other opinion, which is reported by Ibn Umar, Abu Huraira, and a third companion, I forgot his name, only used to have this understanding of the permissibility of doing that. So we have two strong opinions. Now, if I come on the day of judgment, not taking anything from my beard, would Allah Azza wa Jal blame me for that? Nope. Okay. But if I come on the day of judgment, shortening my beard to a fist length, would it be a probability that Allah would blame me for that? Yep. So what is the safest? To leave it. And this is what I'm doing, and this is what I'm inclined to Say, but I wouldn't say it's sinful. And Allah knows best. Ms. Bah from India. Assalamu alaikum, Shaykh. Assalamu uh, In my locality, there is two Muslim groups. Uh, the first Muslim group uh, uh, rejects Sahih Hadith. Sahih Hadith. Uh, like uh, uh, denying the existence of black magic. And they even reinterpret Quranic verses to fit their logic. The other group goes to Dargah and may even commit shirk. So, if I hear the call to the prayer from these mosques, mosque, can I attend or can I uh, pray at home? Also, there is no Salafi mosque. Okay, for, first nearby. of all, first uh, of all, listen, listen, Musbah. Uh, uh, masjids that believe in dargahs and the imam, see, what counts is not the community or the locality. What counts is the imam. If the imam believes in dargahs and going to peers and to grave graves and, and worshipping the graves and the likes and doing shirk, you cannot attend the prayer there behind such an imam and your prayer is invalid. As for those who reject black magic, which is in the Quran, mentioned in the Sahih Hadith, such people have gone out of the fold of Islam because magic is mentioned in Surah Al-Baqarah chapter 2 in verse 102. And Allah said that they learn from, from Harut and Marut what they divide and separate between a man and his wife. And they say, we teach kufr, so don't come and learn from us. This is sihr. And they come and have the audacity to reject it. This is totally unacceptable. So my advice is don't pray behind such people. And if you don't have any Muslim um, uh, masjid 
that you can pray, go to the masjid, the second, the latter one, after the prayer is over, and look for one or two people to pray with you, jama'ah, and your jama'ah is valid, inshallah. This is all the time we have until we meet next time on Saturday. I'll leave you for Amanillah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. قل هذه سبيلي أدعو إلى الله على بصيرة أنا ومن اتبعني وسبحان الله وما أنا من المشركين